I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we are talking to a remarkable woman who has lived an incredible life. She doesn't know the meaning of the word obstacle. She has documented her journey, her life, in a story called Marathon Wheeler, Living with Physical Disability. The book is written by her, Heather Combs, and we're delighted to have her here on Spotlight today. And we thank our friends at Sweet Spire Literature Management for helping us with Heather in the Spotlight today. Heather, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Logan. Lovely to be with you. Lovely to have you. Let's tell the folks at home, first of all, what your book is all about. Well, it's called um, Marathon Wheeler, Living with Physical Disability. And um, there are two particular sections of it. The first section is a memoir of my life from birth to retirement from active work. Um, and then the second part is a series of appendices on practical hints on um, surviving physical disability and um, thriving as much as you can uh, mm. with a limitation. Uh, but it's also talking about um, hints for um, health professionals as well. Uh, hints for uh, religious communities to make their um, um, their uh, access more friendly and mm -hmm. welcoming, uh, and and their ministry with people with disability. Absolutely. Well, let's talk a little bit about your life. You were born with cerebral palsy, so this has been a condition you've uh, had to deal with your whole life, right? Uh, yes, that's right. Um, the, the doctors still don't know what causes it, but I've had it since birth. Um, I was born in India and um, I was very ill as a baby, um, but um, my parents said I was determined to live and uh, I think that determination has stuck with me um, through my life. Um the way it affects me is that there's a lot of muscle tightness um, and uh, it, I, I live life in a wheelchair mostly, uh, but I keep myself uh, as active as I can with exercise and swimming. Um, and uh, I, I move fairly slowly. So one of the challenges is learning to be patient with myself. Exactly, exactly. And during your life, you studied and became a librarian, correct? Uh, that's right, yes. Tell me a little um, bit about your work there. Okay. Um, well, ever since I was a teenager, I developed a love of reading. And uh, I realized the healing power of books um, to encourage people to be strong in their inner selves. Um, I used to read a lot of biographies and books by Christian psychiatrists uh, to, to help me through the challenges that I was having as a teenager. Um, but then um, uh, my first uni degree was uh, behavioural sciences, uh, but after I finished that, my vocational counsellor said I needed a more vocationally oriented course. Uh, so it's then that uh, librarianship uh, came on the on the scene and uh, I studied uh, for a further year on that. And um, then I worked in a law library for a little while while I was training um, and then following that, I worked with an organisation called um, the Australian Council for Rehabilitation of Disabled. Mm -hmm. and, and that was in Canberra, which is in Australia's national capital. And it, it was a lo lobby group to government. And uh, the information service supported that work. Right, right. So most of your work as an adult has been in Australia. Uh, that's right, yes. Um, uh, the first part was in New South Wales 
uh, which is a, a more southern state, but now in retirement, um, I, I live in uh, Brisbane, which is Queensland, uh, to be closer to family. Wonderful, wonderful. Tell me a little bit about the message you're trying to get across to readers uh, to make them more comfortable and more aware of people with physical limitations. Okay, well, um, particularly uh, the second part of the book, I hope to be very practical in um, uh, easing people's anxieties about relating to people with disabilities because uh, some people think, oh, am I going to say the wrong thing? Am I going to do the wrong thing? I'm going to feel like a klutz. Well, I'm hoping that the book um, will help uh, minimise some of that anxiety, uh, but also um, to encourage um, people with disabilities themselves uh, as to how to live more uh, as productively as they can and to focus on ability rather than disability. Um, yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, and it, it's got a wide audience, I think, because if, if you haven't got a disability yourself, uh, this book might be also helpful in overcoming any kind of uh, major adversity that you have. Absolutely. It helps you deal with the challenges that life throws you and all of us are thrown our fair of challenges as you go through this life for sure. I notice that, and it's something I consciously do, if I'm, you know, when I walk around my community, I say good morning to people. I particularly make sure I do say good morning to somebody in a wheelchair too and make eye contact with them as well. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't have a comfort level with, like chatting with you when you're in a wheelchair. Do you find that, that you sometimes have to break that little barrier or, or fear that people might have because you're different, because you're in a chair? Yes, kind of yes. Um, I, I think um, to develop people skills is uh, very important and to make uh, enable people to feel at ease. Um, yeah, I, I have a wicked sense of humour and I think um, I, I need that humour sometimes to help people relax and enjoy. But I also realise like, like any good relationship, it takes time to develop. You can't get to know someone easily unless you... Uh, consciously want to devote the time to really learn what's going on. Absolutely, absolutely. Tell me about writing the book. Did you enjoy it? Was it kind of therapeutic on some level? You got to understand yourself a little bit better? Um, I, I wrote the book after um, I retired from active work um, and part of it was therapy to, to try and make sense of the kaleidoscope of uh, experiences that I've had over my life. Um, but then um, in addition to that, I, I realised that there was a, a wider mission, really, a wider mission to um, educate people about what disability or what my disability was like, but to expand it to other disabilities as well because some of the principles are the same ultimately uh, we're people and uh, people first and the disability is sort of secondary yeah. exactly exactly focus on people being people not people having different abilities you know just connect with the human yes That's absolutely Tell me how your Christian faith has helped you over the years. Well, um, my, my life has sometimes been very um, challenging. I've had uh, lots of time in hospital uh, with treatment, especially as a young child. Mm -hmm. And uh, I spent a lot of time away from family at home. And in, in that sort of situation, uh, you realise that you need uh, the friendship and companionship. And uh, 
for me, uh, a friendship with with God was very helpful, very helpful in giving me strength, um, you know, to get through uh, a challenge in my young life. Um, I At one stage I was in plaster flat on my back for four and a half months mm. and uh, that requires a lot of uh, persistence and a lot of patience. Uh, and so my faith helps me with that. But it it also helps me um, realise that uh, my my condition is does not define me. Mm-hmm. I'm more than my condition and that I have a, a purpose uh, to care for people, the, uh, for the person right in front of me at the time. So... Um, uh, the challenge is not to become too self-absorbed um, and to realise that there's more to me than this chair. Absolutely, absolutely. You mentioned you spent a lot of time in hospitals and medical facilities when you were younger, particularly as a child. I think when you spend a lot of time at a hospital or a doctor's office, you start realizing that the nurses, the technicians, the aides, the assistants are kind of like angels. They're such good people. They're so helping. They're so caring. Uh, That's right. Yes, Uh, most of them are. And uh, I'm really grateful uh, for the times that they've gone the second mile. Um, I remember once after a particularly long hospitalization uh one very caring nurse um went to her car and got a uh, a christian video uh, uh not a video a cassette for me to listen to and to calm down after a particularly challenging day of bad news mm. uh, so that was going in the second mile yeah, yeah absolutely a very kind gesture indeed Tell me a little bit about the title of your book, Marathon Wheeler. What did you want folks to know from that title? Okay. Um, I realised that uh, in my situation, my disability is lifelong. It's not going to magically disappear. And so it's a marathon. Uh, It's a long-term race. It's a long-term race and not a short-term sprint. So I've got to have um, sustained the breath uh, for for the the long race. Um, Yeah, and uh, the other thing with a marathon as well is that, uh, and I'm thinking of the Olympics here, um, you, you often have crowds of people cheering you on as you run your race. And uh, this has certainly been part of my experience that it's not a solitary experience that um, people can encourage you and tell you uh, to encourage you to keep going when the going gets tough. Absolutely. We all need our cheerleaders. We all need, you know, someone there to help us in our time of need. I remember from times being in the hospital, just hearing the footsteps of someone you love coming into the room is like a magical sound because you're gonna be distracted, you're gonna have comfort, you're gonna have conversation. It's all so important. That's right. And uh, family for me has been um, a bedrock really. Um, uh, And a good family is someone that you can let your hair down with and share the good times and the rotten times. And, uh, yeah, so I've been very blessed. Um, uh, My parents were very supportive. And uh, now after they've gone, I have a a brother and sister-in-law and uh, four niece and nephews. Wonderful. uh, And great nephews, and they give me a lot of joy. Absolutely. I have great nephews myself. And uh, when I see them, they just uh, spark my heart. They really feel great. It feels great to see them. It reminds you of what life is all about. Absolutely. And the spontaneity and all of that. 
Yeah, the joy of them playing, their innocence. Uh, like I say to their parents, I could just watch them play all day long. That would be my movie. Let's talk a little <laughs> bit about um, the government response to folks who have differing abilities. Over here in the States, we have the American with Disability Act, but it doesn't seem to do much. I mean, the times I've had to wheel parents in wheelchairs, it's hard to find a curb cut. It's hard to find a doorway that's accessible, elevate. There are so many challenges that are put in front of you that could be made much more easy if you know some planning was done. Do you agree you have the same situation in Australia? Um, yes, uh, th there is some access, uh, but it, it still needs vast improvement. Um, I, I remember once um, seeing um, a disabled toilet, but you had to go up about three steps to get to it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and I thought, my goodness, they don't realise. They don't realise. But uh, in Australia, we have... Um, a new system called uh, the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Mm -hmm. And the government um, gives us um, a, a packet of money mm -hmm. um, to, to um, spend on carers who come uh, into my home and help me dress and shower. Um, I have a carer who came to me at 4 a.m. this morning uh, to to help get me ready for the interview. Wonderful. Um, uh, and so the NDIS, National Disability Insurance Scheme, enables me to do something like that to ensure my social and community participation. Wonderful, wonderful. Are you still working? Um, well... Uh, I know you're uh, writing. That's work. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, that's my work at the moment. Uh, okay. I'm not being paid for work, but I, I was an aged care chaplain uh, mm -hmm. before retirement uh, and worked in palliative care mm -hmm. quite a bit and worked with families as they uh, navigated the, the challenges of having older people in uh, residential care. Um but I, I still keep very busy uh, in my church life and also in, in writing and, you know, publicity events and that sort of thing. Sounds great. Are you working on any other writing right now? Um, well, um, I, I've written um, another book called Many Faces of Grief, mm -hmm. Finding Pathways to Healing, and uh, that is an examination of different grief, not not only bereavement, but uh, things like um, pregnancy loss, um, mm -hmm. the grief that we've felt through COVID, um, mm -hmm. uh, the grief that um, people going to jail will experience, uh, and the regrets that they might feel with with that. Um, mm -hmm soldiers uh, with PTSD, uh, and and then I try and list some pathways to finding some degree of peace. Yeah. What, what are some of those pathways? I mean, you talked about some very significant life events that are as hurtful as a death, uh, your father going away to prison, you know, uh, being locked down during COVID wasn't any fun. What are some of those pathways to break that cycle of grief in your life? Um, well, uh, uh, I, I find that a sense of community uh, is important, that even in, in COVID, uh, you can still connect with people via Zoom. And COVID has, has brought with us a lot of opportunities for communication that we weren't using before. So community is important. Um, meditation for me uh, and prayer uh, is a help. Um, uh, also, uh, I'm just trying to think, uh, having a supportive 
um, like person a network of around, friends and families. Yeah, yeah. Friend, friends and families to help sort um, not not solve your problems, but know that you're being cared for. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Knowing somebody care, cares is very, very important. What was light lockdown like for you? How did you uh, sustain yourself during that? That was a tough time for everyone. Well, actually, um, can I make a confession mm -hmm. um, that initially uh, COVID was a blessing for me hmm. uh, be because it gave me permission to have a rest. <laughs> I see. Yep. Yeah, it gave me permission to have a rest. But in the middle of it all, uh, I thought, ah, this is getting a bit long. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, how can I be more productive? And I think um, that was when I started my um, book on grieving. Yeah. Gotcha. So that uh, that kept me occupied for a while. Yeah. The COVID lockdown was a mixed blessing. I remember I did a lot of walking, spent a lot of time with my dogs, did a lot of reading, um, did a lot of saving actually too, because you weren't able to be out there buying things you actually kind of saved more money i was looking at my bank account it's like my work is getting canceled but i have more money so go figure <laughs> um so it, it was kind of like the best of times and the worst of times you did get to reconnect with family members you did have long chats on the phone with people who uh you knew might be by themselves that kind of thing absolutely absolutely and uh it it's a, a test to do things creatively. I mean, uh, our, our church, for example, instead of meeting together, we had Zoom, church via Zoom, and uh, there are a lot of church meetings with Zoom, and uh, it, it kind of helps us to understand that we don't have to be stuck in a rut. Absolutely, absolutely, that there are ways out there are different avenues to explore and uh you use up here it helps you a lot like you started writing your book on grief tell me finally a little bit about the writing process of marathon wheeler when did you write that did you write it in the mornings evenings did you dictate it did you type it tell me a little bit about that um, I, I'm one of these people that I've got to be in the mood for writing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. um, I, I, I can't write in a disciplined way that at, at nine o'clock in the morning I will write for half an hour. I can't do that. I've got to wait for the muse to happen. But having said that, um, even if I, I had chronic cases of writer's block, um, I would kind of try and start something and not over-edit it in my brain, mm -hmm. write thoughts down uh, and then edit it later because I think self-judging is one of the major blocks. Yeah. Exactly. Don't limit yourself. I always say to writers, just write. You yeah. can always rewrite it or delete later. But don't stop yourself from having that thought. Just write it all down. And, you know, I've been a writer my whole career as a journalist and an actor. And, you know, I would just write. And if I didn't like it, I'd rip it up or keep sections. So writing is just a good idea. Like you said, don't self-judge. Don't self-edit. Just write. Well, we're glad you wrote this book. It's a wonderful book. It's very inspirational. Uh, it's called Marathon Wheeler. In a way, we are all running marathons. We all have challenges in our life. We all have obstacles thrown in our way. And you can smile at them and be filled with good cheer and good joy like Heather Combs. If you follow her philosophy that is espoused in this book, it's highly recommended. Heather, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. Thank you very much, Logan. Really was, appreciate it. It was a true pleasure speaking with you. And to the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time. Until next time on Spotlight.